and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite A-lister food writers. It's about life, culture, politics, all through the prism of food. And this week I'm with Gilf Anderson, executive chef at River Cottage and Hugh Fernley Whittingstall's main man, to talk about his new book, Great Salads. It's just a really exciting dish and it makes that what some people will find quite a boring ingredient really shine actually and it's such an alternative way of using it that you won't you don't really know you're eating cauliflower by the end of it you just get wrapped up in the in the whole flavour. You know you're going to get quality food chat when it comes from River Cottage and after playing captain's mate there for the last 10 years Gelf is still pulling rabbits out of the bag literally. But I first met him when he served up the first ever vegan feast at the Savoy, hosted by a women's networking group. The guests were Joanna Lumley, Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, and CEO of Compassion and World Farming, Philip Libbury. But it was the food that silenced the businesswomen. I asked Gelf how he managed to stop 200 networking women in their tracks. Um, well, it's a very good question. Working on a farm full of vegetables helps. <laughs> I think is is the really good start starting point. Um, but really, it's. A lot of chefs find it really difficult to make vegan food interesting, but it's moving away from the old comfort things of just putting nuts on stuff or some kind of fake cheese and just really understanding that that veg can be super interesting all the time Um, and using similar techniques that you would with meat. So on that dinner you were just referencing, we smoked the onions which normally you would associate, you you would only smoke meat or fish perhaps. Um, But it adds that depth of flavour. And the the one comment we got back was everybody thought there was smoked bacon in that dish somewhere. And actually, obviously it was completely meat-free and we made kind of a liquor out of the smoking, uh, the juice that we braised the onions in, how that beautiful sort of smokiness we reduced into like a marmite almost. Uh, And we painted that back on the onions. So it's really, you know, taking as much care of a vegetable as as you would normally as a chef take care of a piece of meat. Yeah, uh, it it was those smoked onions. You're absolutely right. And I remember people just chatting about, you know, nonsense networky stuff and being quite boring. And suddenly everyone came to a stop and went... How on earth did he do that? Is that me? Is that me? And suddenly the whole conversation changed. And that's what it's all about for you, isn't it? I mean, you know, you say in the book that it's your really anti industrialization of food. But at that particular uh, feast, it was a compassion and well farming feast. It was political. It is to get people to stop in their tracks and think, actually, we can do this. Yeah, I mean, food is it is it is very political, and I've been learning this over over the years at River Cottage and Hughes' influence as well. Um, and it really is starting that conversation. And food is a great way of doing that because we all we all need to eat, you know. And we all, I think, almost everybody I've ever met takes some form of pleasure from food. So if you can put something in front of someone that really surprises them and satisfies them in all the ways that a meat dish or a fish dish normally would. Um, then you're really you, you are getting your foot in the door really in that thing and and we still eat meat at the farm we are omnivores uh, still but we we just eat a lot less of it and um, I say veg is really coming to the fore and with the growing world population which compassion and world farmers obviously concentrates on world farming um, we are going to have to eat a lot more veg and we're going to have to start learning how to make it really Absolutely. interesting. Absolutely, and it was Philip Limbury telling me way back on the Delicious podcast back in I think 2016. I first talked to him, and he said something that really changed the way I do everything. Actually, he that means eating and and talking to people like you. Um, he said we have three opportunities every single day to make conscious choices about what we eat, and it's as simple as that. We eat three times a day. So choose better. And that's exactly what you do in this book. It's about constantly coming up with new and exciting ways um, to to make a vegetable interesting, a salad interesting, dressings interesting. And that's what you do. It is part of the River Cottage philosophy to do that as well. Where do you separate from River Cottage as executive chef? Where's the Gelf in River Cottage? Well, I've been there for 10 years, so I've, I've really ingrained as part of it i think um it's really interesting we we've, we've changed and when i started she really started to change this the, you know this journey onto sort of veg led food you know with the release of much more veg which was a you know a great selling book but also a great book in itself with the with the recipes etc um and i was really fortunate so I, I grew up as a vegetarian so i i had a really good base understanding of, of vegetables um but also just getting out in the garden because even though you're surrounded by veg and gardens at river cottage is getting not just me but all of the chefs out into that garden 
and exploring the produce every day rather than getting stuck in that little kitchen and not not really seeing the opportunity so that's really been my focus is getting everybody out into that garden on a daily basis making sure they know what's going on and just working with you know in harmony with the seasons which you have to if you're picking straight from the ground I mean, I have seen that in action. River Cottage, I have to say, is my favourite place on the planet, I think. It is an absolute encapsulation of everything that I believe in, in in food. And I had a wonderful, I've been down there a few times to interview various various members of your community down there and uh, went down there for a lovely lunch that Gil Mella and Steve Lamb made me. And Gil had made, I don't know how many different hummuses, I think five or six out of different (laughs) vegetables that he just literally kind of plucked from the ground. And everything was really beautiful. But you're right, everyone buys into that culture completely, don't they? It is a, it's like, it's almost like being in a in a cult where everyone sort of is is absolutely on message. How does that work? Is it literally that you're all picking and absolutely rhapsodizing about the food, or or does he sort of sit down and play the guru and and you know give you the lessons in how to be river cottage? I mean, Hugh is a great guidance, obviously, and he's you know he's he's full of knowledge and he knows lots about politics and environment and all the rest of it. Um, we're just we're quite careful about the people we choose that come and work with us i think we normally choose the right people um rather than the right amount of people i think you can get trapped running a kitchen saying you need 10 chefs so you just have 10 chefs whether they're the right ones or the wrong ones um so i like to make sure they're the right fit regardless of experience because when you get to river cottage you have to kind of forget everything anyway so you kind of you 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 forget a lot of your restaurant training you need to really sort of start from the bottom up um so we just get the right characters, really. And they, the people that come to us are, are those right characters. They're, you know, they're interested in everything that we do. Uh, and they're just interested to learn as well. So um, you, can, you can come to River Cottage without anything like our apprentices do and leave a fully formed chef that can bake, that can fishmonger, that can butcher, can make cheese, charcuterie. You know, there's nothing you won't learn. Uh, spending a couple of years with us. Yeah. And and it's it's interesting when you say you have to forget everything that you learnt in the restaurants. I mean, that probably was the old days. Uh, is that still the same thing? I presume you're talking about waste and about sourcing properly. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I first started cooking, which it seems like a lifetime ago now, only 25 years ago, um, you know, it's all about getting the biggest and shiniest ingredient, no matter where it came from or how it was produced you know we were flying stuff from the other side of the world just because we wanted the biggest prawn for example whereas now now that has changed and the and the industry is changing there still is a de- degree of that sometimes um that you see in, in certain restaurants and methods of cooking but we are getting people coming to us with a better understanding than we would have done say five or six years ago um I think it's just be, it's really come to the fore. Not just you, but there's been various other celebrity chefs and books, and um, you know, even people like Michael Pollan and uh, those kind of people that really people read and they watch and they they really learn um, before they get to us, which is great because it means we don't have to teach them everything from the from the bottom up. But yeah, and I think that is driven a lot by the consumer as well. So our our customers want to know, you know, obviously at River Cottage they're they're coming because you know that's what we do, but the wider restaurant industry because the customers want to know food provenance they want to know something about sustainability and they want you know some kind of you know guarantee that that's what you're producing and you're not just greenwashing stuff or just using the right words like local or sustainable you're actually putting some kind of weight behind them as well yeah i mean it's interesting isn't it because there is a massive i mean what roof cottage does is it encapsulates all that we need to do to save the planet to have compassion in world farming to have all those conscious consumer habits really you know it encapsulates all of that stuff but at the same time we've got a massive sort of british food culture coming out of our immigrant food Mm. cultures which is fantastic you know it's really enhanced how we enjoy food how we are interested in food and you use a lot of those flavors you know rose harissa and garam masala and you call them salad lifting spice blends um chinese five spice for example i mean there's two narratives isn't there there's the grow it all yourself pick from the land be really connected with the land in order to understand how to eat to save the planet and then there is eat from around the world spice stuff up 
those spices come from abroad in order to enjoy food and engage more with it. How do you work that one? So anything that we import is always organic for a start. So we're, you know, we're moving to being really close to 100% organic in our kitchen. The, the farm itself is certified organic as well. Um, I think we're, with spices, I've always looked back in history a little bit, and we have been importing spices in this country in a very bad manner to start with, <laughs> just to clear that up. But it has become part of our heritage to use these spices. And we don't just stop at British veg. We do use lemons and oranges and and, and various different um, uh, foods. What we try to think is if we can find an English alternative to, to that spice or, or citrus fruit, then we'll use it. But what we're not going to do is constrain ourselves by saying, well, we're, we're not, we can't use any flavours that we can't get in the UK. Because... If you look through the history of River Cottage, right from its from its onset, really, there was many different ethnicities of cookery going on, and there's always spice sections in our books. Um, and if you're talking about veg as well and encouraging people to eat veg, you've got to give them the tools to, to really enhance those things. So for us, it, we take as much care as uh, sourcing our ingredients, whether they're from the UK or, or abroad. Um, and our spice rack is something to behold in the kitchen actually there's not much you it's not much you won't find uh, in there but we use a great cooperative um called essentials which which supply all our organic spices um and they are they are incredible because they're organic as well um the flavors are, are, are really intense so yeah we don't we don't limit ourselves to that but we always look to our own shores first and then see see where we go from there. Yeah, and you do. You're all very very clear that organic is absolutely the way to go. But you don't press that on your customers and your readers necessarily. Um, it is the answer to spicing up a lot of these flavours, though. So let's go through some of the the food moments. Um, you know, we bump into pumpkin seed satay. So inspiration uh, that comes from a lot of our immigrant cultures. So conquering cauliflower. Tell me about your roast cauliflower with pumpkin yeah. seed satay. Well, yes, as I previously mentioned, uh, I grew up as a vegetarian and uh, my mum, bless her, was very good at baking cakes, biscuits, etc. But not so great with a savoury food, should we say. And, and cauliflower used to be a real nemesis of kind of soft, overcooked, you know, strong in flavour when, when it gets overboiled. Um, so I, I, I had a real problem with it. I, I basically couldn't eat it. So I spent my years as a chef trying to get on board with, with how we prepare it in a nice way. Um, and this came about a little bit by accident, actually. But I was looking at a way to change the satay sauce because pe peanuts in there, they have two issues for me. They were, they were a tropical nut. And um, also there's lots of people that have severe allergies to them which as a chef, obviously, you have to be a bit careful with. And we're starting to use a lot more seeds than we are nuts because of generally the, the environmental issue of producing nuts and the water consumption. Um, so I decided to, to experiment with pumpkin seeds. They worked really well. Um, and I just tasted the satay and thought, you know what, with a nutty cauliflower, that should roast really well together. So I lobbed it in the oven and there we go. It, it, we've tweaked it. We've added lots and lots of um, mint and coriander in at the end and tossed it through baby gem. So it's, it's still just warm when you eat it. Um, and I was really pleased with it. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's great. I love eating this dish. And then it came to shooting the book. And I and, and Gil Meller helped me sh uh, do the photographs of this book. And um, our photographer, uh, photographer, Emma Lee, who was fantastic and her assistant, uh, India, um, we, we cook this dish up and when we shoot our books, there's nothing fake about the pictures. We actually cook the food. Um, and not only did Gil and Emma and her assistant, but all the staff that are around their day, that day cleared that dish off the table first. And I was like, I was like, right, I think, I think I've won with that one. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and conquered your, your fear of the cauliflower. Indeed, yes. I mean, there's, I've got a few other dishes up my sleeve these days, but yes, that is my go-to one currently. Um, and it's a real crowd pleaser. Everybody at home loves it as well. Um, and the family, it's, it's just a great one to, to bring out. And um, it just makes it, it's just a really exciting dish. And it makes that what some people will find quite a boring ingredient really shine, actually. And it's such an alternative way of using it that you won't you don't really know you're eating cauliflower by the end of it you just get wrapped up in the in the whole flavor it's interesting the cauliflower has come to represent so much of the story of british food culture for me you know it's a really i mean i love a cauliflower but it's quite a sort of a boring old thing that nobody paid very much attention to until it became the cauliflower steak 
and the and the queen of the vegan ingredient and suddenly it's kind of elevated it's you know it's become a, a celebrity ingredient you know these kind of things don't happen in Italy or Spain or France do they? You know, we, we love to invent yes well we, we are a nation of inventors aren't we and I, that doesn't stop with with just manufacturing goods I think food as well and I think because you know, our, you know, the food scene was pretty poor in the UK going back a few decades. Um, we kind of threw away the rule book and said, OK, you know, we, ha- we have a bit of a he- food heritage in this country and it's great to dive into our history. But we're going to we're, we're just going to throw throw the book at it. Throw, we're going to throw everything we've got from wherever in the world. And we're, we're just going to really invent our own kind of food culture. And I think it may be looking back in 100 years we'll have a whole different food culture that we've kind of invented from scratch, yeah. um, which is quite interesting. I know. And it could, honestly, it could be anything. It could be completely plant-based. You know, we will have this sort of unstable food culture compared to the stable food cultures of the Mediterranean and the, and the Middle East, where anything can happen. And that must be incredibly exciting for you as a chef and a thought leader in cooking. Yeah, it's great. I mean, um, it also shows that the people uh, of this country are really willing to try new things and they're really willing to invest in that kind of, you know, take a risk uh, and eat something that they wouldn't normally do before. Uh, and yes, people, have, they're already embracing this kind of move to, to a more veg-led diet, even if it still in, involves meat and fish. Um, and I think we're, we're probably leading the Western world in the amount of veg that we're consuming now as a, as a, as a country. Some of us are. I think we are (laughs) split down the middle in terms of class on that one. But yes, I get your point. Um, You've referred to your unconventional uh, upbringing. Um, Tell us a little bit more about that. Tell us about being a vegetarian. Um, You you talk in your second food moment about becoming an omnivore at River Cottage. But tell us about being a child vegetarian. Yeah, it was interesting because, you know, I grew up in the 80s and being a vegetarian still wasn't that common. Um, and it was, you were quite, you know, it's classed as being quite strange to be a vegetarian. And, um, my parents were, you know, hippies, essentially. (laughs) They they grew out of it uh, when I was a bit older, but, um, and so we did, you know, we, we went to the health food shop on a Saturday and we were buying all our own, you know, different grains to go into our muesli that we ate every morning. We had a little veg patch out the back. Um, and we, you know, we ate a good diet, you know, it was very, very healthy, um, but yeah, it was it was odd growing up uh, like that. My, I can remember my grandma saying that you know we'd never grow up healthy because we were only eating vegetables. And um, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm pretty healthy, and uh, you know my brother's six foot two. You know, <laughs> um, so we did all right out of it. Um, but what it did was when I started cooking professionally, I was taught how to cook meat by professional chefs. So I didn't have anybody teaching me with bad habits. So I didn't have my mum or my grandma influencing my opinions about meat before I actually ran into it in a professional restaurant environment. So actually, I look at it in a completely different way. I I didn't have a relationship with it before I cooked it professionally, which is actually a really interesting way to approach an ingredient. I mean, obviously, when I started cooking professionally, I I had to try meat and I had to eat it. And I do enjoy it. It's not something that I don't enjoy. I certainly eat a lot less of it than the average person I probably only eat it sort of once or twice a week and I only eat quite a small amount because I can't physically eat a lot of meat actually because I didn't grow up eating a lot of meat mm. so actually physically a, a few bits of meat I'm quite satisfied and and, and that's it so yeah it, it it was a massive shift uh, but I think it put me in a really good place and it, it, it's really helped my career as well um, because I look to often look to veg first um, as this kind of star of the show rather, rather than meat uh, and like I say just being a you know being taught how to cook it professionally with nothing else interfering has really, really helped as well. But it's very important to you that you do get high welfare. Obviously, you've got the provenance is, is hugely important for uh, River Cottage, but also in your own life. Tell us about this lamb, harissa and char grilled peppers um, recipe. How, how does that honour the the lamb? Yeah, well, it's, it's actually, I mean, it's with with lamb in the book, but quite often we eat slightly older animals like a hoggett or a, or a mutton as well, which is is slightly more sustainable. Um, but for me, I, when I cook a, a roast or you know a big family family occasion, it's so much nicer to cook a big piece of meat. Uh, but there's always leftovers, isn't there? And it's a criminal offence, especially with meat, to waste absolutely anything at all. Um, pre-roasted meat actually works slightly better in the recipe because you get more crispy edges, and you know it's just the texture slightly nicer. So. We're all a bit guilty of going, oh, we'll save this for later and put it in the fridge and then, you know, maybe not using it. Um, 
but I think this one really, I, I get quite, I get more excited about the leftovers than I do the original cooking process actually so maybe i'm guilty of just cooking a bit extra because i want to cook that tell us about those fresh curds yeah so um they, this is just a really quick way of making a very quick soft cheese without using rennet so i mean we, we virtually never use animal rennet anyway we use the veggie one but it's, it's quite complicated you have to heat the milk to sort of 37 degrees you add the rennet and then you have to cut it and set it and then sort of strain it overnight with this you bring the milk to a boil and squeeze some lemon juice in it and that's that splits it out. And this is how you make paneer. Actually, you just press those curds. So actually, I was making paneer for something else, and I just ate the curds and thought, oh, actually, that that's all right. That. <laughs> so we'll put some olive oil in it, and then another squeeze of lemon and some salt and pepper, and it just adds that creamy texture straight away. Uh, and it, they take seconds to make. Growing is in your third food moment. You've chosen um, the charred courgettes, broad beans, mange tout and fresh curds, which is interesting. I want to ask you about that. Um, but your food moment is really about connection with the land and the importance of growing. Obviously, you can do it at River Cottage. It is an absolute idyll in terms of growing vegetables and beautiful soil as well. How important is it that just Joe Public grows their own vegetables and how do they find the time in this ridiculously hamster wheel society of ours yeah well it's interesting because i didn't really start growing at home until i met my partner um hayley and she was a really keen gardener um but didn't grow much veg and i was a bit like well what's the point in that <laughs> um if you're going to grow it, you might as well eat it so between she really encouraged me to get into the growing side of it um, and I, as a chef, I work quite a few hours. So when people say they don't have time, um, I have a quite a good argument against that. So not only do we have a very small back garden, but we now have half an allotment. Um, and we also have another 10 raised beds elsewhere that we look after as well. So through the summer months, we, we're pretty self-sufficient on veg. So in a 70 hour week, I can still manage to grow my own, my own veg. But the real simple base of it is watching something come from seed to fruition and then eating it straight off the plant. You can't buy food like that. So if, you, if, if you're not coming to somewhere like River Cottage that's picking on the day that you eat, you're eating old food. And food that you buy in the supermarket is two or three weeks out of the ground or off the plant, sometimes older. And the flavours change dramatically. So as soon as you pick a plant, it starts changing. It knows it's been picked. It starts changing its sugars to starch. So inherently become a lot, uh, a lot less sweet and a lot less tender as well. So that is that is the joy of it. And you, you will notice that your cooking will change when you grow your own veg. Yeah. Why isn't it the answer to the cost of living crisis? Why do you think that m people who really suffer from food insecurity don't go to that as a... I mean, in the way that people used to, my granddad used to grow absolutely everything because they were really poor and he was completely self-sufficient in his tiny little council house, back garden. Um, why is it deemed so difficult, do you think, for so many people? Well, I think, I think it all starts with education, doesn't it, at school as a child? Um, if, you're, if we taught our kids how to grow and cook, then they don't find it scary later on in life. But you t try and tell someone my age, well, you've got to start growing stuff instantly. It's, it's harder to learn the older you get, don't you? Isn't it? So, um, a lot of people my age can't cook, for example. A lot of my friends my age can't cook, um, and that's simply because nobody taught us. You know, but as you know, with a lot of my friends, both parents were at work, um, so it's quick dinners in the evening, maybe a roast at the weekend, but not a lot of cooking going on. And the same with growing. I mean, gardens have become just ornamental experiences, haven't they? Maybe a lawn with a few flowers around. Um, but like I say, we have a tiny back garden and we can grow all the greens we need in the in the back garden and have a little bit of grass for, for my daughter to play on and um, and the dog to run around on. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll produce all our own garlic, all our own onions. Um, but I think it's it, people are just generally don't know how to do it. Mm. Um, and there's always failures in gardening that could be a bit disheartening, <laughs> especially with slugs and birds and rabbits and all the rest of it. Um, and it's getting over those and just keep plugging away and actually working out what is best to grow in your garden. And then you, once, you, once you do that, you can have some great successes. It's just, it, like I say, it's just that education piece of how do you turn your back garden into something that's productive. Or just have cut and come back salad in a, in a tomato bag. Uh, that, that seems to work, doesn't it? Um, beetroot, three ways with mm -hmm. tamari seeds is your, is your final food moment. I have to say one of those hummuses that Gil Meller did for me was a beetroot hummus that I can still taste today. You say it's what River Cottage is all about. Tell me about that. 
so yes, you can't come to River Cottage without us feeding you a beetroot. Um, <laughs> it's 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 kind of a running joke. Um, they feature heavily on our menus. They're great veg. They grow virtually all year round. Um, they're very versatile. Uh, they we we pick them when they're small, so they're super sweet. Um, so very a lot of people that you come across still haven't eaten anything but a pickled beetroot, and that's worlds away from what a beetroot really is. Um, so we we just love playing with them. The colours, the flavours. Um, whether you turn them into a hummus or you just simply roast them, you can eat them raw. You can pickle them. You can you, you could do so many different things. We put them in desserts. We make ice cream out of them. Um, so it had to, you know it had to feature. And again, I was you know beetroot growing up was that kind of boiled root that was probably a bit old and you know not not that exciting to deal with and a quite quite. A, you know a combative flavor if you're you know for the first time that you eat it it's very strong um but it, yes it it works beautifully well in the, in this dish especially calm down with a bit of cheese and it's that that salad itself is something that features on quite a lot of our dinners actually as one of the courses looking through the list of fruits and herbs and, and vegetables in the book it reminded me of how many varieties we have in this country and how few we use i'm just looking through Gooseberries, green gauges, damsons, turnips. Can you do for the turnip what you've done for the cauliflower? Uh, well, that's slightly harder, <laughs> I think. Um, so t- with turnips, it's all about the su- the size. Anything over a golf ball, they're they're pre- they get pretty harsh in flavour. So you need to pick them young. Is a simple fact for that. If you pick them young, they're absolutely great. You can eat them raw. Again, you can pickle them. We we've been fermenting them as well because we have a massive glut of turnips e- every year. So I. I I literally put them in brine with three or four chilies, so they get really quite hot. Um, but it takes quite a lot of this sort of uh, sulphur flavour out of the turnips as well, which is which is quite interesting. Um, they are slightly harder to sell than cauliflower. They don't they, they don't quite you caramelising them. They go they go a bit soft. It's very hard to get kind of crispy edges on them as well. But they're definitely worth um, they're definitely worth a look at the right time of year. It's just those big turnips you get in the shop. I'd, I would steer clear of those personally. Yes, and and the gooseberry. I feel terribly sorry for the gooseberry. Gooseberry is so so delicious, but it does take a little bit of of work, doesn't it? Because of those tops, you have to individually top them. Um, is anybody going to do that when we've got so many fruits from around the world in the supermarkets? Um, well, I think it's a shame if you don't. I mean, I love, I do love gooseberries, and they do feature in in a few recipes few recipes of the book um but at this time of year we're the, and this you don't have to top and tail we make a, a gooseberry cucumber and lettuce gazpaccio which means just all in the blender sap it up with a few a bit of olive oil and, and some garlic and some mint um and that just kind of removes the need to prep them which is great um because it is a bit faffy it's faffy to pick them as well with all the thorns um but as well as that we, we like chopping them up and putting them onto fish and, and savory food as well we use them a lot in savory cooking rather than we do use them in dessert cookery, but uh, yeah, feature more in our savoury food. So 10 years at River Cottage, are you going to do another 10 years? What's next? Well, what is next? River Cottage is forever changing, so it keeps it fresh. I mean, I've been, um, you know, obviously we've had a bit of a change after after sort of three years of craziness. Um, we've kind of restructured the business. Obviously, writing this book has been fa- fantastic. That's been another another thing um that's been really sort of interesting um watch this space because the second one's probably going to be coming next next year uh which which will be great um but yeah we've also been sort of developing a big range of our own products with sort of river cottage names of organic products which i i've developed with Hugh, which has been really interesting making sort of our own stocks and ketchups and that kind of stuff um we're, we're you know constantly working at the farm we're constantly trying to do better and um, we have just opened a new restaurant on our, you know, at the top of our track, essentially overlooking the valley. So that's, you know, that's a new project that we're, you know, constantly developing the food, food for that as well. So, and the new TV series, you know, we've just finished filming that. So um, that was bonkers as well. And then hopefully get some sleep at some point would be great. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You can read the transcripts to the show at jillysmith.com. Just click on podcasts and do sign up for my newsletter while you're there. You can also get in touch on social media. I'm at Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith on Instagram, where you can follow my adventures in cookery with leaths online. Check the show notes and on Instagram for full details of how to get Cooking the Books discounts on those leaths cookery courses. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>